Good. So um, thank you so much to, am I, am I on mic? I'm good? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'll just do the laser pointer on the screen. Oh, I'm so used to wearing this thing, right? I forget that it's on. I wanna just say thank you so much to the organizers for making this thing happen. It has been over two years since I have traveled, gotten on a plane, given a talk, seen friends, and I'm really grateful. I'm also really rusty giving talks, so bear with me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about imaging condo holes in Samarium hexaboride with a little bonus cameo by um, uranium ruthenium 2 looking 2 And I want to give a ton of credit to my graduate student, Harry Puri, who has really carried this work through the last five years. Um, and he has just been fantastic. He is headed off to uh, Europe for a Marie Curie fellowship. Um, and I'm going to miss him a lot because he, it's been a real joy to work with him. Um, also credit to Mohamedian, Richard Liu, Christian Matt, and Tim Yonarayan, and, um, and others who contributed to this data. Uh, and thanks to the Moore Foundation and the National Science Foundation. Okay, so why do we like SMB6? Because there are controversies, and we like controversies. <laughs> so uh, from 1955 to 2010, you know, the, the number of publications was kind of bumping along here. And um, the big controversy was whether this anomalous low temperature conductivity was from some kind of bulk impurity effect uh, and or surface states. And in 2010, Pierce Cullman and collaborators um, made the case that this was a topological material with a surface state. And then the controversies really took off. So you can see the number of publications going up to over um, 2000 in a five year period. So the controversies of the last decade have been the surface state velocity and location of the Dirac point, um, the topological protection of the surface state, uh, whether there's any backscattering. And um, in the last five years, there's been a big controversy about the quantum oscillations, whether the bulk quantum oscillations are due to some kind of impurity effect or some kind of very exotic um, non-charged Fermi surface in the bulk of the material. Um, okay, so the surface state controversy has been solved. We know that there are surface states from a number of really beautiful um, and careful transport measurements. Um, but I'm going to talk today about conclusions from STM on the subject of the other controversies. So um, let me start by reviewing our work from, that was published during a pandemic. So you may not all have noticed. So I'm going to do just a couple slides review on the heavy uh, direct surface states. Um, so at high temperature, samarium hexaboride is a metal. Uh, it's got a conduction band and some F states that don't interact with each other. Um, as you go down in temperature, um, oops, uh, as you go down in temperature, the F states and the conduction band begin to hybridize. A gap opens. You can see the resistivity increasing at low temperature. Um, and then at the very lowest temperature, there's this resistivity plateau and the suggestion by Coleman and collaborators that there's a topological surface state, a heavy topological surface state um, spanning this hybridization gap. Um, but initial studies looking for the surface state were quite contradictory. There were a lot of transport studies that showed definitively there was a surface state, but they can't measure anything about the velocity of the surface state. Um, there was a, Luli had some early quantum oscillation work, which was exciting, um, showing that there was a surface state, but it was a lot faster, a lot lighter than was expected. Uh, and there were a lot of ARPES experiments which showed surface states, but they were pretty uniformly 10 times lighter, so 10 times higher slope than expected to span this hybridization gap. So we did STM on this material, um, and when we cleaved the surface, we were able to find large areas um, that had a reconstruction where half of the samariums are missing from the surface, um, but it was quite ordered um, otherwise. And the advantage of STM is that we can view the top and the bottom of the hybridization gap. We can see empty states as well as filled states. Um, we have high energy resolution, um, and we have real space and momentum space information. So we uh, measure the density of state. We map the density of states as a function of energy in space. So uh, spanning the Fermi level, 0, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30. Um, and we're going to Fourier transform that. And we take the Fourier transform, we'll be able to see incoming states scattering off of defects into outgoing states, and the incoming and the outcoming standing waves interfere um, and give you a wave vector that's the difference of two eigenstates of the material 
Um, this is called quasi-particle interference, and we can use these measured interference vectors to back out original eigenvectors of the eigenstates of the material. Uh, so here's raw data from different samarium hexaboride samples where we have Fourier transformed the um, real space density of states. This is as a function of energy, and this is momentum. So here is the gamma point in momentum space. And we can see as a, a function of energy in the raw data that there is some kind of a very heavy Dirac cone here. Um, and I've guides to the eye on the right side, but I've left the raw data visible on the left side of each of these images. Um, these are samples from two different growers, uh, six different um, tips and doping levels, um, and they all show the same thing. Um, so to compare this quantitatively to the other results that were out there, um, if we look, I, I glossed over a little bit, there are actually two expected Dirac cones um, at the X point and the gamma point of the material with slightly different velocities, both pretty heavy, but one a little heavier than the other. Um, we can measure the velocities of these Dirac cones and um, find that they agree quite well um, with theory within a factor of two of theory. Um, However, um, ARPES was a factor of 10 higher and quantum oscillations was a factor of 100 higher um, in velocity. Um, furthermore, we can look at the location of the Dirac point and we find that in both the X point of the Brillouin zone and the gamma point of the Brillouin zone, the Dirac point is very close to the Fermi level within the bulk hybridization gap. Um, and again, this agrees with the theory. So, um, it's nice that we agree with the theory, but we still have to address the question of why other techniques might not be seeing the same thing that we're seeing, uh, why they're seeing uh, faster um, direct cones and varied direct points. Um, so Sumerian hexaboride is a rock. It does not cleat easily. Um, so we basically have to smash it. We fracture it. We glue a post onto it and we whack it. It is the hardest we have ever had to whack anything to get a flat surface. In our STM. And even so, you can see that this surface is pretty interesting. Um, now, luckily, STM is a high resolution technique, so we can zoom in a very tiny area and we can find flat regions. Um, and we find some flat regions that look like this on the left that have a complete samarium termination. And we find some flat regions that look like this on the right that have um, half of the samarium atoms missing. Um, so if you have all the samarium atoms present, uh, then you have a polar surface because the samarium is charged two plus. Um, and so electrons are going to have to come to the surface to compensate for the, all of those extra samariums at the surface. And when those electrons come to the surface to compensate, it pushes down the density of states. So these are two density of state spectra that are measured on the one by one samarium surface in blue and on the two by one samarium surface where half of the samarium have cleaved off. This should be a nonpolar surface. Uh, shown in red here. In both cases, we see some kind of a phano resonance of the F states hybridizing with a conduction band, but on the polar surface, those states have been pushed down much farther below the Fermi level by about 20 milli electron volts, which would be below the bulk gap. Um, so a cartoon of what's going on is that when you cleave and have this kind of interesting surface here, uh, some regions are going to have the Dirac, heavy Dirac cone with Dirac point in the gap, and some are going to be pushed down below the Fermi level um, and below the bulk gap. And if you're uh, not a spatially sensitive technique, um, then you might average over these two different terminations and see something very roughly qualitatively that looks lighter and below the gap. Um, so we did this a little bit more quantitatively. It's nice to show cartoons, but quantitatively, can we actually simulate this? Um, so we made two models, one that looks like the expected theory in red here, and another one that um, just pushes the whole, everything below the Fermi level down by about 20 milli electron volts, taking into account the extra electrons at the surface. Um, and we just took a 50% average of these two things. Um, and my postdoc, Christian Matt, who had a former life as an expert in ARPES, um, did this simulation uh, with two different sets of PES, uh, parameters from the two different detectors that he was familiar with um, from two different published papers. Um, 
And I was, I was quite pleased because when I showed this simulation to Dong Lai Feng, um, who published a, a paper on this, he said, oh, that's my data. And I said, no, um, this is your data here. This is my simulation of your data. Uh, so that was kind of a triumphant moment for me. Um, and, and then just with a different set of parameters here, um, you can see slightly different temperature, slightly different energy resolution, slightly different momentum resolution. Um, our pest can see an entirely different thing. This is our simulation uh, and this is the data. So I think this really explains why STM is able to see these very heavy Dirac cones with a Dirac point in the gap. Um, and it's harder for a technique that doesn't have the spatial resolution to distinguish between these different terminations. Okay, so uh, I think we've resolved this question. Um, we have heavy uh, states with the, the heaviest ever seen, about 400, effectively 400 times the mass of the electron. Um, so let's move on to the main point of this talk. So I want to talk about condo holes. Um, and I'm going to type into these controversies at the top, and I'm going to claim that condo holes can actually give us some insight into the two open controversies here. So condo holes produce local charge fluctuations of the conductance electrons. And that's the point I want to explain pedagogically here. Um, so starting with some older theory, this is from Dirk Moore and Jeremy Figgins in 2011. Um, they did some careful theory of what happens when you pull a spin out of a condo lattice. Um, and they showed that the, uh, the, the vacancy defect um, sets up oscillations in several different parameters just around that defect. The first one is the hybridization strength itself. So remember those F electrons are hybridizing with that conduction band um, and that hybridization strength or that hybridization gap can oscillate in space away from the location of the defect. Another thing that oscillates is the charge density itself. So there's actually more electrons, less electrons, more electrons, less electrons in a ripple away from that defect. Another thing that oscillates is the magnetization um, oscillates spatially away from that defect. So the question is, what is the wave vector of oscillation? Um, and the answer is a little counterintuitive at first, that that oscillation wave vector is related to the conduction band before the hybridization occurred. So we're talking about a condo lattice here where the conduction electrons have adjusted themselves to accommodate those F electron moments. Um, so this is a fully hybridized situation. And then you pull out an F moment from this fully hybridized situation. And the response occurs at the unhybridized wave vector of the conduction band. That is very counterintuitive at first. So I wanna step back and try to explain a little bit pedagogy how that happens. Okay, so at high temperature, a condo lattice um, is a bunch of moments, um, F, let's say F moments um, shown in gray here. Um, and some conduction electrons shown in blue here. Uh, and so at, at high temperature, you have your conduction band. Now I've zoomed way in on this energy axis here. So my conduction band is, is so light that it's you know, almost vertical on this small energy scale here. And then I have my heavy F band. This is just a cartoon. This is not any particular material. So some heavy F band, some conduction band that's so light that its bottom is in the basement. Um, and then at uh, low temperature, the conduction electrons line up to try to cancel those local moments. Um, and so the hybridization occurs between the light conduction band in blue and the heavy F band in gray and gives us this new band structure shown in orange here. And these conduction electrons and this F electron kind of hybridize, make this heavy fermion state that actually has a very high um, wave vector, a very short period in real space, kind of oscillating like crazy around each one of these moments. Um, so schematically, in a Briwan zone here, we had our original conduction band, which was light, small vector. Um, and we had our, uh, now we have our hybridized heavy band, which is oscillating much faster in real space, higher wave vector. Okay, so now what happens if I pluck out a condo hole, take the condo hole out, uh, take the, the F moment out, and now the remaining blue electrons are going to have to adjust to this vacancy. Um, so the blue electrons are like, hey, there's no moment here to try to screen. I don't have to be here anymore. 
So they bunch up, they, they can leave, they can flee the scene and they can bunch up to try to screen the neighboring moments that are still sitting there. So we get an excess of conduction electrons around the neighbors um, and fewer conduction electrons around the condo hole. So the charge density is gonna look something like this. Um, now, because there's nothing, uh, because there's, there's more electrons here to hybridize, um, the actual hybridization strength of each electron doesn't have to be as big. So this condo hole, by pushing more electrons over here, allows the hybridization strength to be weaker next condo hole. So we have an oscillation in the hybridization strength, delta V. Um, and this has actually been measured experimentally in uh, uranium regime two silicon tube by Mohammed Hamidian with Seamus Davis. Um, and uh, that's, that's a clear experimental result. Okay, it also sets up oscillations in the magnetic susceptibility. Um, and uh, if you have more electrons here, the magnetic susceptibility can be higher. Okay, so we put this all together and we see that all of these phenomena are oscillating around the condo hole, but they are conduction electron phenomena. They're not F electron phenomena. It's how the conduction electrons are reacting to the F electrons. So all of these phenomena are not occurring at this super fast oscillation of the heavy band. They're actually occurring at the light band wave vector. So the, the periodicity has to do with the light band before the hybridization, not the heavy hybridized band. So how can we see this? Um, the experimental requirements are going to be mean uh, nanometer space resolution, sub milli electron volt energy resolution, Kelvin temperatures. Um, STM can do those things. We also need charge sensitivity. STM traditionally does not charge sensitivity. STM can measure the density of states at a particular energy, but STM does not integrate over all the charge in the system. Um, so I want to talk about a new way of viewing STM data where we can get a handle on the charge density in this particular situation. Uh, okay, so your ruthenium 2 silicon 2, some things have been measured and proven in this material, so I want to start with this one as a test case. So again, we have energy versus momentum. The light band hybridizes with the F band, gives you a heavy conduction band here. Um, and sets up a phano resonance in the density of states. This is data from Seamus Davis's lab that I borrowed from him. Um, this is the topography of URS and it has thorium dopants in it. Um, at the location of a thorium dopant, um, the hybridization is broken and there's a symmetric um, peak in the density of states, whereas far from the thorium dopant in gray here, um, we recover the phano resonance and the hybridization. So the thorium dopant adds a condo hole. Um, the thorium dopants do scatter electrons um, here. They're each shown in white. Um, so this is the density of states, shows scattering. Um, but they also uh, set up a, they also shift the condo resonance. Um, and you can see this, this shift from center to left here. Um, and so I want to make an argument that we can measure that, we can quantify that, by looking at the asymmetry near the Fermi level. So near the thorium dopant, this spectrum is very symmetric, farther from the Fermi dopant, um, farther from the dopant, it's less symmetric. Uh, so what we do is we just integrate the density of states in the small region on the right and on the left of the Fermi level, and we plot that rectification ratio or the ratio of positive to negative. Um, and we see that um, in the background where the um, phano resonance is strong, that rectification is very large, whereas near the dopant, that rectification is quashed. Okay, um, so let me just get to the punchline here on URS. The density of states shows us this hybridized band and scatters off of the thorium dopants with the wave vector of the hybridized band shown here. Whereas if we plot this rectification ratio, um, you can see the rectification ratio has oscillations in real space too. And those oscillations of the rectification ratio, which is a proxy for the charge, are actually at a different wave vector corresponding to the original conduction band. So this works in, in URS, a material that's known. The question is, how does it work in SMB6? Um, let me take a brief diversion. I'm out of time already, huh? Okay. Okay. Um, 
So, so let me come back to our, uh, our paper on the um, heavy Dirac states. So this paper, I just need to tell you a story. This paper took us eight years to publish. Um, so <laughs> Harry Perry is very persistent um, and did a great job. And why did it take us so long to publish? So, so we went through multiple rounds and the basic story boiled down to referee A saying, your QPI signal is too weak. I don't believe it exists. And referee B saying, well, if it's topological, there should be no QPI because there should be no backscatter. Right, so how do we reconcile these things? Um, so here's a, a, an image, a larger image is SMB6 with different site defects. Uh, red and green are condo holes. Um, yellow is a boron site defect, not a condo hole. Um, you can see zoomed in, we can tell the difference between them. Uh, we Fourier transform it. We see our, um, our heavy Dirac state here. Let's focus on a particular energy. Um, and just plot the whole uh, XY Fourier transform. So now I'm looking in QX, QY space. This is that uh, Dirac cone at that particular energy. Let me Fourier filter out everything except for that Dirac cone and see where in real space that scattering is coming from. So now I inverse Fourier transform and I see that the scattering is coming from particular locations. Now let me superimpose it on my original image. And I can see that the scattering, yellow, where the scattering is high, is coming primarily from the condo hole sites and not from the boron site defects. Okay, so condo holes scatter heavy fermions. So that satisfies our referees. Now the quantum oscillations issue is, a, is the biggest outstanding controversy, I think, because um, it's been shown that this material is a very good bulk insulator. However, it shows um, very nice quantum oscillations at the light band frequency, not, not the hybridized band frequency, the light band frequency. Um, so how do we explain some kind of bulk quantum oscillations at the light band frequency? Um, there's a lot of exotic explanations, um, but I want to focus on the quantum hole on the condo holes and show that the condo holes in samarium hexaboride also have this property that they set up oscillations in the charge at the light band frequency, not the heavy hybridized frequency. So the density of states here, um, let me just put this together. Okay, this is the basic result. The density of states, DIDV, oscillates at the heavy band, hybridized band frequency, whereas this rectification ratio, which is representative of the actual charge, oscillates at the light band frequency. Um, and this provides an understanding of how the bulk of this material, so Jitris Sebastian's floating zone grown samples that have a lot of samarium site defects in them um, could show quantum oscillations in bulk at the light band frequency. And if you wanna know why they don't percolate and make a, a bulk conductor, you have to talk to Brian Skinner. Okay, I think I'm basically done. Okay. <laughs> from the audience yeah uh, so for the last thing that you said uh, so uh, if it, if all these oscillations are coming from condo homes uh, then shouldn't one expect that in some probe like NMR that you'll see the effect of uh, big disorder in the system yeah so I I don't know why I don't, I, I admit I'm not familiar with the NMR results. Is anybody here more familiar with the NMR results than I am? Can we weigh in on that? Sorry? NMR saw in gap states. NMR saw in gap states. Lou Lee says that NMR saw, yeah, but saw no, in gap states. But the, there's no broadening of NMR line, uh, MQR line, as you cool down low temperature. It's very narrow. I don't know the answer to your question. Thank you, Santal. I'll look into that. Uh, regarding this, uh, taking one uh, F electron out, is there any difference uh, for the case of topological content insulator and the regular content insulator? Because theoretically, in the pre model, 
kind of hybridization for topological system is comes from the nearest neighbor hybridization. So I'm wondering if you pull out one F electron for the topological condensate, this uh, condo hold uh, behave differently. Yeah, that's a really good question. So Eric Mascot is a graduate student with Dirk Moore, and they have looked into that, and um, their their calculations match what we're seeing. And beyond that, I would have to refer you to them for the details. Jenny, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on these very nice results. I mean, I can confirm that these hexaborides are really difficult. Thank to you. And I, I should have acknowledged I mean, all of the effort that you've put into this too. I um, mean, you've, you've laid a, a great groundwork. I, I do have a question with respect to the surface. I think you mentioned, and uh, you also wrote you in, in, in the Christian Matt paper, that is, do you expect the samarium at the surface to be more towards two plus because of the missing hexaborides? Yeah, I, 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 I glossed over it a little bit. It's not an integer. It's two point something, but yeah. Yes, uh, but there's also the counteracting effect because basically what you said in the second half of your talk, when you basically take the uh, boron octahedra away, you also uh, reduce the condo screen. That's what's referred to by Pierce Coleman as the surface contour breakdown. Yeah. And um, it's also described, for instance, by Tim um, um, uh, Allen in the, in the 2016 film Mac. So I think there are two effects here uh, counteracting each other. And if you look in the X ray absorption spectroscopy data, uh, actually they go more towards three plus at the surface. Now, What's your take on this? I mean, X-ray absorption has a certain uh, probing depth of maybe, I don't know, four, five, six, it depends on the incident angle. We actually change that angle to be more surface sensitive, but nonetheless, you have, I don't know, eight unit cells or so. Uh, why, why do you favor the two plus over the three plus? Well, I guess it does, in our in our model, there's a there's a big fudge parameter, which is what fraction of the surface is what termination. So we're essentially averaging two determinations, um, and we threw in fifty percent, fifty percent because we didn't want to. We, we haven't imaged a big enough area ourselves to really have good statistics on that. So I think that if you had a three plus surface um, and a neutral surface, you know that would you could the result of our model would not be any different than just changing the fraction one surface versus another. So I think that we were able to get a pretty good quantitative match with a 50-50, but in reality, you're right, maybe some surface had more charge, but there was less of it. Yeah. I'm gonna ask one very quick question, and yeah. I know we gotta move on. So we're just trying to understand this picture. So you see Friedel oscillations associated with light charge when you look at this rectification measurement. But I mean, that's that's some structure, that's some spatial static structure, which of course is what you measure in SVM. How, how, what does that tell us about excitations that are, you know, being absorbed in, in quantum oscillation? Why does that correspond to exactly. Dehaspen Alpha? Why does it correspond to dynamics? Um, I mean, are, are, are there, you know, traps or zero modes associated with these impurities or? What we know is that there's charge fluctuations associated with these impurities. Okay, dynamical so, charge fluctuations. Yeah, so, so that's what we know. And I think that the, the contribution that I'm gonna emphasize here is unfortunately not the, the detailed theoretical contribution, but just that this is an existence proof for something that exists in the bulk that has a light band wave vector. Sure. Um, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of the focus has been on the heavy states. Sure. Um, Okay. So I, I kind of punted your question. I'm sorry. Oh, I understand. Okay. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, but, but, I mean, I'm Chimao well, speaking next, so I get all of you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Chimao. <laughs> yeah, from our outside point of view. So did you actually see an aluminum inclusion? I mean, some people were saying that the aluminum inclusion in, in those samples. Yeah, no, we didn't see. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, there was a couple of times when we cleared your room temperature and we saw aluminum inclusions. But, you know, with STM, we would know if we were looking at an aluminum inclusion. Um, they're monstrous. So like there's, I, I just crop, uh, grabbed a figure from uh, um, the Los Alamos group samples. Um, and, you know, these are macroscopic aluminum inclusions and then they polish them out. And when they polish them out, then 
their quantum fluctuations way, quantum oscillations went away. But in the flux ground samples, they have fewer of these samarium site defects. So, so I think there is a self-consistent picture here where in the flux grown samples, there's no samarium site defects, but there's these aluminum inclusions that can fake the quantum oscillations. Whereas in the floating zone grown samples, they don't have the aluminum inclusions, but it's just not as possible to get, um, to get rid of the samarium site defects. Yeah. Okay. What's the talk to you about this later? Oh, okay, great. Oh, I'm still like, sorry. I walked off the microphone. That's embarrassing. You're going to have to give it to me.